Revelation chapter 8. Your Bible should be just falling into Revelation pretty naturally by now. We've still got a ways to go. By the way, let me remind you, if you didn't pick one up, we have uh, these charts that we passed out when we started this series. But there's still some out here on the table. If you have not picked one up, I encourage you to pick one up. Uh, it really helps you to kind of keep everything in order that we're talking about. We're ready now with the seven trumpets and uh, chapters 8 through 11. And uh, another round of judgment that is about to fall. Back in chapter 5, we saw the Lamb take a sealed scroll, which is the title deed of the earth, had seven seals. And in chapter 6, he began opening these seals. And uh, judgments were pouring out, beginning with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. In chapter 7, we saw an interlude, a parenthetical chapter, when the 144,000 Jews of the 12 tribes of Israel were sealed by God and uh, will survive, uh, be kept safe through this time of tribulation. We saw judgments of war, and famine, pestilence, death, earthquakes. We move into chapter 8 for the opening of the seventh seal. And the seventh seal actually just introduces the sounding of seven trumpets. The seventh trump will introduce the seven vials of God's wrath. The intensity of these judgments seems to increase. These trumpets are given to seven angels. And in this chapter, we're going to see the sounding of the first four trumpets. If you'll come back tonight, we'll get into chapter 9 and see the other uh, trumpet judgments that are brought out. Let's look at chapter 8 this morning, uh, beginning with verse 1, Revelation chapter 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar, of the brazen altar, and cast it unto the earth. And there were voices and earthquakes, or voices and thunderings, and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumps prepared themselves to sound. Let's stop here and note this part. And we're going to look at these trumpet uh, judgments that are brought out. Let's think about the period here that's described. The period that's described in verses 1 and 2. Prior to the sounding of these trumpets, there's an unusual scene in heaven. You see the silence that overcomes heaven here. I say it's unusual because up to now there's been a lot of noise. A lot of singing and, and praising God and, and prayers being offered. And uh, very loud in worship. But now everything hushes for half an hour. Someone said that this means that there will be no women in heaven for 30 minutes. I would never say that. I think that is a horrible thing for anybody to say. And you'll never hear me say anything like that. The women might say, maybe there's no kids for half an hour. Maybe all the noisy kids are taking a nap for a little while. But in all seriousness, it presents to us a scene of preparation for another round of judgment. All the celebrating, all the jubilation ceases for 30 minutes. And there's just silence. Like that. <laughs> Silence can be awkward, can it? But 30 minutes 
not a sound throughout heaven. The silence that overcomes heaven. What's about to happen is so awesome, so terrifying. It seems like heaven is holding its breath for what's about to come. Secondly, you note the severity that overwhelms heaven. The inhabitants of heaven watch as seven angels are given seven trumpets. We've already talked about the importance of trumpets, especially in Israel. They're used for a lot of different things, to, to summon the people together for uh, an announcement, to sound the alarm in time of danger, to begin religious feasts, to announce news, to acclaim a new king. Uh, trumpets were used a lot. We know that a trumpet's going to sound at the rapture. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We that are alive and believers in Christ, we're just going to be translated out of this. That's the trumpet I'm listening for. And I, I believe it could happen at any time. And then there's these judgment trumpets that we're reading about. As God wages war upon his enemies. The ones that said we'll not have Christ reign over us. They would rather have the Antichrist reign over them than the Lord Jesus. So we see seven trumpets sounding to usher in another series of divine judgments. Each one unleashes a judgment of greater intensity to this world. All this is about to happen just seems to overwhelm those in heaven. As this is being prepared. Now folks, as believers, we're filled with gladness as we think about our salvation, about all that is in store for us. And yet when we think about our friends and our loved ones who are lost, when we are raptured, they're going to be left behind. Our hearts are filled with sadness. Amen. Now, I... Some people say they just cannot believe a loving God would do this. These horrible judgments that are being poured out upon the earth. How could a loving God do this? Well, it doesn't surprise me about his wrath. I'll tell you what surprises me is his long-suffering and patience. <laughs> How long-suffering he has been with wicked mankind. Let me share a verse with you. In Ezekiel 33, verse 11, God says, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will you die? Why will you die? So if you're not saved, turn to Christ today. And don't die this horrible death that is coming. You ever feel sometimes I watch the news and they flash a warning that they're about to show some disturbing images. So you may not want to see this. You might want to ch change channels for a moment if you don't want to see this horrible video or whatever it might be. And we can do that. But folks, think, God cannot do that. All right, think about this. God must observe every day, every moment of every day, nonstop brutality, wickedness, debauchery. He can't turn it off. He sees that every day. That's why I say I'm amazed at his patience. That he can be so long-suffering with all the evil that is going on every day. Now sometimes, Betty and I will be watching a movie and they'll show, the, a battle scene can last 10, 15 minutes, some of these movies, just blood and gore. And we'll tend to fast forward through that because I don't want to watch it. I really don't. I don't want to watch blood and gore. I don't understand these people like to watch these ultimate fighters trying to destroy one another. How do you, how's that entertain anybody? Seriously, how does that entertain? I don't get any joy watching 
men beat one another to a pulp. That's the, hey, that's the world we're living in. God sees it all the time. And finally, God is going to do something about it. What's going to take place is God dealing with sin. Unconfessed, unrepentant sin that has rejected his son, Jesus Christ. The saints in heaven rejoice when the Lamb takes the book. And he's going to take back all that belongs to him by creation and redemption. Second thing I want you to see, the prayers that are defined here. Verses 3 through 6. In chapter 5, we saw the prayers of the saints. Once again, we see the prayers of God's people having a part in the end time event. God's people have been praying for centuries. We've been praying for Christ to come. That's a daily prayer for me. Even so come, Lord Jesus. I want him to come. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to see that. We see the prayers that are ascending to God. This altar in heaven is really the heavenly counterpart of the Jerusalem temple that the Jews had. Which There was this altar, the brazen altar where they offered sacrifice. Then there was a golden altar of incense. And we're told that when they would burn incense, that would ascend up into God. And it pictures our prayers. Our prayers ascending up to God are a sweet fragrance to Him. And our prayers are stored. We talked about that the, they're kept in a censer. God hasn't forgotten your prayers. They are remembered. They are stored up. And one day, those prayers you think have never been answered would probably get answered. God's going to move. They would take the hot coals from the brazen altar twice a day during the morning and evening sacrifice, carry them into the temple to the incense altar. The hot coals would ignite the incense and that fragrance would ascend through the temple. Now keep in mind the brazen altar was where the blood sacrifice was made. The sacrifice was to receive the judgment of God. That lamb, that red heifer, whatever it might be, taking the place of God's people. And they would suffer the judgment of the sin of the people. Now we know that picture Jesus Christ. When the Lord Jesus came and died on the cross, our sins were laid upon him, and he suffered the judgment of God for our sins. Think about that. The fire of God's wrath fell upon the sacrifice and it fell upon the Lord Jesus Christ when he was nailed to that old rugged cross. Now folks, understand, Jesus took your judgment so you won't have to. But lost friend, listen to me. If you refuse what Christ did for you, the fire will fall on you. The fire's going to fall on somebody. If you reject Jesus, the fire fell on him at Calvary. But if you reject him, the fire must fall on you. The fire of God's wrath will fall upon you. Don't kid yourself to think you're too good to be damned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Fire is going to fall. Just matters where it falls. Folks, the sacrifice of Christ, that could be a blessing or it could be a curse. The Bible says it's the savor of life unto life, but it's also the savor of death unto death. If you reject Jesus Christ, instead of that being a blessing, it will condemn you. But it's not God's will. It's not God's will that any should perish. But think about prayer. What a potent force is prayer. Saints pray and spread out before God their petitions, and God hears. God hears our prayers. They're placed in the scales of judgment. And in some mysterious way, prayer changes things. In the coming day, as the saints pray, Christ will come forward. And he will add to their prayers the fragrance 
of his sacrificial work on Calvary. Folks, the Holy Spirit's energizing of our prayers and the Lord's endorsement of our prayers makes them quite a force to be reckoned with. Not only the prayers that are ascending to God, but the prayers that are answered by God is in focus here. You ever pray and just feel like it's not getting any higher than the ceiling? You ever pray and just feel like your, your prayers are not being heard? Well, God promises he hears them. Now, God may not act immediately, but God will act. These prayers will be answered. Here we see thunder and lightning and earthquakes. In his essence, this formula for catastrophe is repeated four times in the apocalypse. And folks, prayer has the element of seeking the will of God. Think about this. The purpose of our prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven. It's to get God's will done on earth. Now think about that. Is that what your prayer does? Is that how you pray? That God's will be accomplished in our lives, in our church, in our world. That should be our desire. Folks, prayer is a serious business. We better not move the altar too far from the throne of God where we come to pray. All those prayers have been saved and stored in God's will. The establishing of his kingdom on earth is soon to happen. Jesus Christ himself takes the prayers of the saints and offers them on the altar, the golden altar. He intercedes as our high priest. The Bible says Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacles, which the Lord pitched and not man. So the Lord, he finished his work of sacrifice, but he has a continuing work as our high priest. He's always there to intercede. On our behalf. Now let's note the plagues that are designated. You, you came to hear about the plagues, right? Chapter 8, let's look at verse 7. Buckle your seatbelt. The first angel sounded. There followed hell and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. Let's just take these one at a time. These seven angels began to blow their trumpet. Now, remember the seal judgments were divided into four and three. And so are the trumpet judgments. The first four are war judgments. If you come back tonight, we get into chapter 9, we're going to see the three woe judgments. Four war judgments, three woe woes are added to the wars an interesting feature of the first four trumpets is the description of a third part of certain things being affected we're going to see the trees a third part of the trees of sea creatures ships rivers fountains waters the sun moon stars all of these are affected to a third part of each one we'll see that as we go along but as we look at this, the earth is affected ecologically. There's going to be judgments on land, on the water, on the heavenly bodies. By the way, you probably know as we go through this, these trumpet judgments seem to parallel the plagues that God sent upon Egypt back in Moses' time. And why not? After all, the people of today are saying the same thing Pharaoh said. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey him? That's what this world is saying. Who is the Lord that I should obey him? Well, they're about to find out. 
The first trumpet is desolation in the brewing storm. Desolation. John sees a combination of hell and fire. Now this reminds us of the seventh plague that came upon Egypt. Hell is that which falls from the sky. Fire describes the, probably the volcanic eruptions triggered by worldwide uh, quantities of flaming lava seen around the world. John, John sees them mingled with blood, probably the blood of men and animals because of these judgments. Maybe the, the water turns a blood red. It destroys a third of the trees, a third of all the grasslands. Here's the destruction of crops and plant life on a massive scale. I mean, this is a true disaster worldwide. We've already noted a worldwide famine. And this only worsens the situation. There's not the crops needed to feed the people. The plant is denuded of a third of its trees. Now, we've already seen a deforestation in our country to a great extent. They say that only enough vegetation remains to produce 60% of the oxygen it consumes. Modern warfare now includes the deliberate defoliating of large areas to deprive ground cover for the enemies. A man is doing all this to himself. Now, a literal fulfillment of this is, I believe, very credible. This could easily happen. Some say, well, there's also maybe a symbolic meaning here. You know, the Bible speaks of grass as being people. Jot this verse down, Isaiah 40, verse 6. All flesh is grass. Surely the people is grass. So it may have a symbolic meaning. There's the destruction and the boiling sea. Look at verses 8 and 9. The second angel sounded. As it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. The first trumpet judgment falls on the land. The second falls on the water, on the seas. This reminds us of the first Egyptian plague when the Nile River was turned into blood. Think about this. One third of the seas of the world become blood. John sees a massive object plunging into the sea, wreaking havoc on the seas of the earth. Probably saw a, a giant meteorite striking somewhere in the world's oceans with explosive power, a, a burning mountain burning with fire as it spews into the sea. A third of the ships, the merchant ships, will be destroyed. One guy said that there's 25,000 ocean-going merchant ships that are registered. Another guy says there's 50,000. You might check it out. I don't know. We'll say somewhere between 25,000 and 50,000 merchant ships are destroyed. Imagine the shock waves of this. The, the shipping industry. 8,300 ships suddenly destroyed. All their cargo is lost. One third of marine life dies. The pollution of the water, the death of so many creatures greatly affects the balance of life here on earth. So Brother West, do you really believe that's going to happen? Yes, I do. I believe the Bible. I believe that this is the Word of God. Look at verses 10 and 11. And a third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the stars called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. 
And many, many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So here we have death and the banished star. The word star could probably refer to any celestial body other than the sun or moon. But John sees another massive object from heaven that seems to be disintegrating as it reaches Earth's atmosphere and causes a, a shower of meteorites and asteroids. Again, some point to a symbol, a symbolic figure here. Because they say Satan is symbolized as a fallen star. This may be another reference to his coming. The word lamp, sometimes used to speak of a torch, was really used in ancient times to describe meteorites and comets. Their fiery debris from the star falling on a third part of the rivers and springs of the world, polluting the fresh water. Not only the salt water, but now the fresh water is made bitter. It's called wormwood. That's interesting. Wormwood is a shrub whose leaves are used to manufacture uh, absinthe, which means undrinkable. It's so toxic that the manufacture of this has actually been banned in some countries. It's very bitter to the taste. And it falls into the waters. It makes the waters bitter and poisonous. Many die. I thought it was interesting. You remember Chernobyl in Russia? Do you know what Chernobyl means, wormwood? That's the Russian word for wormwood is Chernobyl. Say, so what's that got to do with this? I don't know. I just wanted to bring it up. Maybe that's a hint of what's to come. All the destruction that caused in that part of the world, that's not going to be limited to a part of the world. It's going to be worldwide when this happens. If a star actually struck the earth, folks, our globe would be destroyed. So this star, this heavenly object, comes apart as it enters our atmosphere. And keep in mind, folks, all of this is controlled by God. I mean, you don't have to have a scientific explanation. These are supernatural things we're talking about. God is in control, and God can do whatever he chooses to do. Remember the Israelites encountered bitter water at Marah, and Moses purified the water supply for them. Well, there's going to be no supernatural purification of water when this happens. Nobody's going to be able to fix this. Then look at verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them were darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of the heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. By reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Three woes for three more judgments that are coming upon the earth. But this fourth trumpet is darkness from the blackened sky. This parallels the ninth plague of Egypt. Let's go back and read that. Exodus chapter 10. I want you to see how this affected the Egyptians back in the day of Moses. Exodus chapter 10, look at verse 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward the heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. By the way, remember the 144,000 are protected from all of this. As God protected the Israelites in Egypt, 
The, the plague didn't come upon them as they did on the Egyptians. So the 144,000 will be protected when these judgments come up on the earth. You ever felt darkness that, I mean, that you could feel it? Darkness that thick? I remember years ago, we, was it Blanchard Caverns, I think it was? We went down into those caves. Of course, they got all these lights in there. And the tour guide was telling us about people that went in there years ago to, to uh, explore these caves. They would take you know, their light in with them. He said, now, if their light went out, they were in trouble. He said, let me show you. They turned the lights off. That was darkness that could be felt. I mean, you could not see the hand in front of your face. I'd never experienced darkness like that. But it made me think about this. The darkness is going to fall upon this world during this time of judgment. And keep in mind, hell's called outer darkness. Those who die without Christ are going to be cast out into outer darkness. Say, so preacher, how can hell be a fire and be dark? Because God wants it to, I guess. That's how it's described. A place of total darkness. The word translated word smitten back in Revelation gives us our word plague. A plague comes upon these heavenly bodies so that a third are darkened. Uh, tell you what, go to Revelation 16. Let me show you something else. The fourth vile judgment is going to reverse this. Let me show you this. In Revelation chapter 16, and uh, look at verses 8 and 9. Now, this, this is a judgment yet to come, the vile judgments. Verse 8 says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men are scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. So one plague brings darkness. Another plague yet to come brings great heat that scorches men with the fire of the sun. So there's darkness in this plague. Uh, all these are bad, aren't they? And yet the angel says, what's coming is worse. What's coming is worse. Woe unto the world when the next three trumpets are sounded. The imagery is that of a strong bird rushing to consume its victim. Where it says, I heard an angel flying through the mist. Some translations read, I heard or saw an eagle flying through the mist. It's not a contradiction because the word there is not angelos, the, the regular word for angel. But it's a word that can speak of an eagle and angel. The angel flying like an eagle through the skies. So it describes... The judgment is about to come upon this world. Let me read what Jesus says about this. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 27. Jesus said, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear. For looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's not the rapture. That's when he comes at the battle of Armageddon in glory to establish his kingdom. And back in verse 21. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So Jesus is referring to the same thing that John sees in the book of Revelation. These things are coming. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. You find that 12 times in the book of Revelation. 
It really means more than the people who are living on the earth because some will be saved. But the inhabitants of the earth is, is actually referring to what we would call earth dwellers. To the earth dwellers who choose this world over the world to come. They love this world. They live for this world, not for the world to come. They live for the things of this world. Those are the earth dwellers. That might include some of you. But the earth dwellers will not repent. They'll blaspheme God when all these things happen. You know, at the beginning of human history, heaven and earth were united because our first parents honored God and obeyed His will. But then Satan came along and tempted them to focus on the earth, and they disobeyed God. You know what? That, that caused a great gulf between God and man. That we cannot pass over and have fellowship with God. The great gulf prevents us from going to heaven. But then the Lord Jesus Christ came, and he bridged that gulf when he died on the cross. That chasm was bridged by the Lord Jesus Christ. And now there's a way that we can cross over into the next world and be with God. As Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. But folks, no sinner need face the judgment of God. Christ has already borne that judgment for you so that you won't have to. Brother Sam, would you come? We're going to have our hymn of invitation. If you're not ready for the Lord to come, today you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to get ready and, and meet the Lord. You know, the Bible says today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. You can do this. You can harden your heart against the calling of God. But I trust that God, through His Spirit, will speak to you today, that you will come and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior.